you already mentioned that uh, in the Western culture, the problem of the commandment is strictly linked to the problem of will. Each time that you find an attempt to define what a commandment is, it will be, it will has have always the form. A will is a commandment is an act of volition, is an act of will. You cannot understand what a commandment is if you do not understand that it is essentially. <coughs> uh, that's why. Uh, <coughs> We now need to, in order to continue our archaeology of the commandment, to try to develop a kind of an archaeology of the will. So our archaeology of the commandment will continue in the form of an archaeology of the will. But I can already tell you that uh, I will try to follow a suggestion by Nietzsche and in some way will reverse the definition according to which commandment is will. Eh? My hypothesis will be that to will means to command. This is Nietzsche idea. In uh, this book Beyond God, Good and Evil Chapter 19 is uh, devoted to the concept of will and commandment. And uh, well, I will just quote uh, a few sentences. Uh, the will, uh, das Wollen, the will, uh, uh, usually Nietzsche is considered as a philosopher of the will, but Nietzsche had always a great suspicion concerning the concept of will is also a great critique of the concept of will. Therefore, he writes, the will, das Wollen, seems something confused, desultory. <coughs> In every act of will, there is a thought that commands. And it's impossible to split this commandment from the act of will. <coughs> as if will could as if will could exist without that. It could. I just quote uh, <coughs> Will is a passion. It is the passion of commanding. <coughs> a man who wants to command has something within himself that will obey, and he believes in this obedience. One wills only, uh, you will only when you expect the effect of the commandment, that is to say, obedience. In every volition, there is only a, it is only a question of commanding and obeying. So it's only a question of commanding and obeying. <coughs> And uh, in his book on Nietzsche, Heidegger comments on this uh, passage uh, by Nietzsche and he restates again that uh, to will means uh, to, to will, uh, that, uh, sorry, to, to will means to command, and that uh, even this uh, will must be uh, conceived as an entrust night, a decision, the resolution. So I will. Uh, I, we are following Nietzsche's hypothesis then that uh, will is commandment. But let's start uh, with uh, When you begin uh, an investigation, an historical investigation of the concept of will, and you will immediately uh, find that the scholars, because uh, while on commandment, as I told you, there is uh, almost nothing, on the contrary, on the concept of will, there is a huge literature, uh, really possible to read uh, all these uh, books on 
will. But by the way, uh, there is uh, something similar between uh, will and commandment because both are almost never really defined. So when uh, people say uh, uh, to command means to will, uh, the commandment is an act of volition, this is a perfect example of what we call uh, uh, trying to define uh, an obscurum per obscurius, an obscure question through another even more obscure. Because no one was ever able to <coughs> define what to will means. And if you try, you will see it's really obscure. It's one of the most obscure concepts in the history of our culture. So, uh, and when you to investigate on that field, you see that the scholars will start by saying uh, it's a curious fact in Greek philosophy, in Greek culture, in classical Greek culture, they seem not to know the concept of will. And there is almost nothing which will really correspond to our concept of will. I just quote some uh, interesting uh, authors that uh, state this. <laughs> For instance, the, the great French classicist Jean-Pierre Vernat. Vernat. He wrote a very beautiful essay, short, a very rich and beautiful essay, on the concept of will in the Greek tragedy. La volonté de la tragédie grecque. It's very interesting. Right? And, and there also he shows that uh, uh, what we find there <coughs> It's not really what we mean by will. It's, uh, it is as if the concept of will was really strange, extraneous to Greek culture. That's we we find uh, so it's kind of commonplace between among the scholars. Greek classical culture did not know the concept of will. Sometimes uh, uh, some of the scholars uh, are uh, in a way partial interest in because we are one of the first one who made uh, this uh, statement uh, it's in a famous book on uh, the Greek and the rational. The author, said Dodds, was a priest. So when he clearly states the, the Greek did not know the concept of will, it is an interesting view because uh, uh, Christian theology always pretended to have discovered the concept of will. <laughs> but usually it's like that. Usually the, you will, uh, the scholars will say Greek, Greek classical philosophy did know the concept of will, then slowly Roman Stoic philosophy began. And then Christian theology really developed this concept. It, so it's a, uh, in, in some way it is true. For instance, uh, we find in Greek many terms which could correspond, and that in the dictionary sometimes are translated with the term will. But we see, we will uh, quickly see that they are not quite the same. So there is a term. Bulesis and the verb bulonai, which means the rational deliberation that precedes an act of decision. So this is what they call bulesis, the, the deliberation before acting. So it's not it's not real what we call a will, and, but it's often translated as will. Then you have the term telesis and the verb telon. And this, this two terms means simply the fact to be ready, ready to do something, to be prepared to do something. So it's not exactly what we call a will, but they will be translated in the dictionary as a will. So to, to be ready to do or not to do something. Then there is another more general term, orexis. But this means simply, generally, desire, appetite. So, common to all living beings. So, this also cannot correspond to our concept of will. 
just more fuse on the on man. <coughs> then we have two juridical terms, because of course even uh, in the <coughs> Greek uh, law, uh, they had in the process a problem to distinguish between uh, acts that we today we call voluntary and uh, non voluntary. Involuntary, so, <coughs> so in, in the law, in the process, you have to distinguish between these two. <coughs> but they had two terms that we translate voluntary and involuntary, but this term meant, because Akon and Akon, Akon mean, meant just a, an act which is imposed by other, by the outside. Ah, sorry, Akon. While Akon is an act which is not imposed. So it's similar to a concept of will. So, so we have uh, many, uh, five, say five, six terms, which will never exactly correspond to what we express with one term, will. Because the only one term will we, we cover all these um, this many terms. Uh, but this, so you see, this does not mean, as scholars pretend, that the, really the concept is absent. The concept of will. It is different concept, no? which uh, needs to be expressed through many. Now, what's interesting in an archaeology eh, is also not only to see this great uh, change in the history of the concept, but also try to see how this change, were, this great change, uh, were possible. How uh, a concept, a modern concept like a will, eh, through which modalities eh, it developed from the context. And so, if we really follow the formation of this concept, modern concept of will, we find a very interesting fact. It is that this uh, term, or this verb to will, uh, graphs and develops, grows from another concept, which was this really very familiar to the, Greek, to the Greeks, the concept to can, uh, to can, uh, potentiality, possibility. Uh, the term to will uh, grows up from these terms. Uh, we, when we s follow the history of its formation, uh, it begins by modifying, uh, developing, uh, changing the concept of potentiality. Okay. To will <coughs> is a transformation of to can. And we could even sorry to be able to to be able to mm -hmm. why not to can? Well, can is just the combination of it. Uh, you can you cannot say to can. That's a curious thing. They the understood what you meant. This like verse in, in English is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in, uh, in, uh, in uh, French, German, Italian, etc. You have clearly a term for, for each of these mm -hmm. uh, like also for the Term, or what in, in French we say devoir, or in German sollen. Don't have a term, clear term. All <coughs> the so, uh, this is an important question because this term, this verb, are called modal verbs. And they play a fundamental role, not only in philosophy, but really in the structuring of our culture. Uh, and um, these modal verbs, are why well, they are called modal modalities. They are modes of being. We have the concept of being, but then being like that is uh, neutral, abstract, but being <coughs> gives itself always in modalities, modes of being, to be possible, to be necessary. 
to be contingent. Potentiality, contingency, necessity. And these are the categories of modalities that are called in philosophy. And they are the modes through which being gives itself. So that you, you, you cannot have an experience of being like that. No? The concrete experience you have of being is to be possible to be necessary, to be impossible, to be contingent. And it, in these um, uh, verbs so are powerful uh, operational devices right? because they really uh, shape the experience of man. <coughs> something is possible, something is impossible, something is necessary. So they are, they are really powerful tools. Yes. Would you say that they're part of the apparatus of philosophy? Yeah, you can say dispositive apparatus, but so but you have to understand how powerful these are. Uh, we, we use them uh, in a very simple way, in a neutral way, but then, then but then uh, really to experience an impossibility. I can. I can. Necessity. That's a very powerful and concrete experience. And probably man is the being who experiences possibilities, necessities, impossibilities, etc. But if you go now back to a problem of how the verb, the modern verb, to will. developed from the modern verb to be able. I will say to can. <laughs> <laughs> Let's force the language and say to can. Can I ask you something? In, in Italian, what's the origin of use? Potere? Potere, potere. Which is also power? Then uh, as a substantive, it's a power. There is a verb. Potere. Yeah, potere. Pouvoir. I like French. Pouvoir. Poder. Poder. So, uh, even we could say that the transition uh, from the ancient man to the modern man coincides with the transition from to be able to to will. This transition from potentiality to will. Uh, Greek man is a being who can. Modern man is a being who will. Greek man is a being of potentiality, of possibility. Modern man is a being of will, volition. That's, a, I think, a very important point. But so, <coughs> uh, so in, in some way, to understand <coughs> the transition from uh, can to will is to understand the transition from uh, Antiquity to modernity. As I told you, so these uh, so called modern verbs, we can. You don't have a, a, in English a, a term for a term, a term for the necessity. It is too to must. To must. You can say to must. <laughs> Let's say to must. You can say to can, to will, to must. Going back to the Germanic words. It's, it's important. No? It's really important sometimes to force the language. Because if, if you have to conceptualize, I mean you can say duty, but it's not the same thing as a must. Now I told you that uh, philosophy in some way has to do with these modern verbs. And it's a kind of a, a practice of thinking which tries to work with these modern verbs to link one to the other, to split one from the other, etc. And so the activity of thinking has to do uh, with these modern verbs. But 
this model works has uh, something very peculiar. They are empty. The ancient Germans, who identified uh, this uh, category of this model verbs, used to say immediately this modal verb are kena, void. Why they are void? Because they need another verb which, uh, which follows, that must follow in order that the verb is full. <coughs> so I, I eat, I walk, I write, they are not empty. But I will, I can, I must, they are empty. <coughs> So they need another verb. Curious. So it is very important. Verb are empty. So in some way the ability eh, of uh, thinking, so the skill of the philosopher is to be able to work with empty verbs. What does it mean, I will, I can, I must? Then, uh, um, what we see in the history of uh, philosophy is, as I told you, that sometimes uh, we have one of these terms, which uh, grafts on the other, is linked to the other, then it develops from it, or it, uh, on the contrary, it uh, is linked, not, not sweet, not sweet. Not, you see, no. Not. 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 Will to can and must, and perhaps uh, the most, uh, the limit case, really, the most absurd attempt to link these three verbs, we found find in Kant. Kant, to express uh, the very core of his moral, once wrote, Man muss wollen kennen. You must can we <laughs> literally not literally it's not a good translation but literally you <coughs> must can we you must be able to be as if you say be able to lose mm. part of the strength <laughs> man must man must volunteer <coughs> that's uh, that's why perhaps I told you this already Kant is usually considered the founder of moral ethics. It is completely false. Uh, Kant is the impossibility of an ethic in modernity. Because how can you build an ethic on this proposition? You must, can't we? It's really insane. It's just insane. <coughs>
which they will try now is, is that clear? I think this is a very important point at this point of the modern verbs and really try to understand uh, what uh, we mean when we use them. Uh, Chris, I always quote uh, 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 something which the great uh, Russian poet Anna Kmatova uh, writes. Uh, he, she was, uh, uh, so, uh, his son, her son had, has, had been in prison during the study of the era. So the other, like many other women, mothers, etc., she was on the line, uh, uh, waiting in the, on the, the door of the prison could open to have some new <coughs> And uh, so this lasted for days and days, etc. And once she see a woman recognized her that she was a poet, and she said, can you tell this? And she was really struck. Then after a moment, answered, I can. Okay. So, what did she mean? Man? What did she mean? I can. So she, she, I don't think she meant, uh, I'm so, uh, I master the language, I'm so skilled that I can, and uh, something really more terrible, more, uh, very, very, you really are engaged in something that you can, and you feel that you cannot, that you cannot, because to can and to cannot are always uh, linked. So the experience of potentiality is uh, perhaps the most proper and difficult experience of man. To compare men to animals is always just a thought experiment, because we do not know nothing anything about animals. But perhaps, again, with this uh, limitation, we can say uh, perhaps the difference between <coughs> animal and man is precisely that, that the man is a being who can. The animal is different. It's not, it's not uh, uh, capturing the potentiality. It, he, it does. He, can, he does what he does. He lives. Uh, and, uh, the the uh, the cat jumps, but has not the experience. Can I jump? Yeah? It's really a very human uh, experience. Experience. Of, can I or can I not? So um, so let's now try to uh, for, to show how this concept of will developed appear. And although uh, scholars, as I told you, uh, often state that uh, in Greek we do, we do not find this concept, there is, uh, we, I will, we will now read a passage in Aristotle, in which we see clearly how the concept of will develop, develops from the concept of potential. Very interesting, uh, quite clear. So the, the passage can, uh, is uh, in uh, the book of Metaphysics. You know that this book, which calls Metaphysics, uh, is just uh, they are just uh, notes from the lessons of Aristotle. In this book, as you probably know, uh, Aristotle develops these two concepts, dynamis energia. Potentiality and actuality. 
But uh, dynamis, dynama in Greek means both potentiality and possibility. Eh? We used to distinguish possibility and potentiality. In Greek, there is only one term. Eh? I think it's not useful to distinguish. <coughs> possibility, potentiality, just the same thing. Energia, is it actualis, it's, uh, you, you have there the term ergon, which means uh, work. So, to be in work to be operative, to be operational, to be... So these two terms are very important in Aristotle philosophy. They concern, again, modalities of being. There are two modes, Aristotle will say, uh, <coughs> through which being is said. Two modes of saying to be. To be, to be possible and to be in, in act. Real. Doesn't mean that the uh, dynamism is not real. <coughs> Why did Aristotle develop this two concepts? <coughs> Probably uh, he wanted to insert movement in being. <coughs> being like that seems something uh, immobile. But if you conceive uh, being as a movement from potentiality to actuality, you have inserted uh, time, movement into being. But this is not uh, our point, We're just trying to, to see the connection between potentiality and will. Uh, but first we have to follow his definition of potentiality. <coughs> definition, mm -hmm. we will never define. You know, there are philosophers who define their concept and other philosophers who do not define the concept. But uh, uh, another useful methodolo methodological uh, uh, important question, um, in every good author, in every good book, you will always find concepts and problems. They must be read together. They must be linked. In a good book, concept and problems are linked. And then you understand properly a concept if you understand to which problem they respond. In which context are they used. While, on the contrary, often you will see books in which uh, you have a concept and there is no problem. Stay interested on the oh, that nice idea. <coughs> what is the problem? No problem. <laughs> Sometimes you have a problem, an interesting problem, no adequate concept. So it's a, I see the problem, but you don't give me any concept to think it. So the important thing is to be able to link problems and concepts. So in, so in this case, so the, just to see correctly these two interesting concepts, potentiality and actuality. Right? So the first question I try to answer, to what problem they fit, and which problem they fit, and perhaps this of uh, inserting movement in B, but also uh, to understand the status of human technology. Why is it that? Because when Aristotle uses these two concepts, he refers to the way in which men possess capabilities, technologies, faculties. That's why he will, in the beginning, distinguish carefully the dynamics, the potentialities which he calls irrational <laughs> or natural from the human ones, the rational potentialities. So we we'll say uh, th there is a big difference. Fire can only burn. So the natural potentialities can only one thing. That's why they are not interesting for him. Human potentiality can always a uh, thing and you are able to uh, think or also not to able to see. 
So, so for instance, if you make the sample, a doctor can make a man recover or not. So the human potentiality is always double. The thing and its contrary. While the natural one is uh, just uh, the fire can only burn. Fire will never become cold. So, uh, that's, so he will not care about uh, natural potentialities, he will only care about uh, rational potentialities, which are always, only, 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 always double. Do you want to ask something? Would the structure of society also fall under capabilities? The structure of the society that the individual finds himself in? So, I, as I told you, he tries to uh, think through this concept of uh, human uh, capabilities. I don't know if you can transfer to, in which sense you could transfer to a society. Do you know what to ask him? It's the most general concept, eh? but he, try, he really <coughs> uses it for this problem. So that's why he also distinguish, uh, also another distinction he makes is uh, the potentiality in a very generic, generic sense. Mm -hmm. So you see, we say uh, this child can become uh, uh, an architect, a poet, a lawyer. <coughs> so uh, it's not interesting. So this comes, this generic possibility. It's not the one uh, interesting for Aristotle. So we not use Dunamis and Delia uh, uh, for that. What is interesting is the potentiality of a subject who already has the power to do it. <coughs> so he's interested in the potentiality of the architect to build or not to build, in the potentiality of the uh, flute player to play or not to play, so <coughs> capability, the ability, or as you say, habit from a, the verb to have exists an important term the habit. can you say <coughs> habit, habit in, 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 in uh, meaning the, the faculty you have the possibility you have so for instance uh, Glenn Gould has the exist the ability the capability the dynamis to play the piano so this, this is what uh, it's called excess from the verb to have, the possession, the possession, have. It's a very important concept. So it's only interest of what interests Aristotle is the dynamis, the potentiality, when you already have the capability. And the problem is, yeah, you have this capability, but how do you put it? How you pass from uh, potentiality to actuality? Why it is problematic? Because when you define, as it does, potentiality through the head, so as something that you have, this means that you must also be able not to exert it. Otherwise, it will be kind of, uh, if you only can, is not a positive potentiality. If Glenn Gould was a kind of, of mad man that can only play the piano, then he's not he can, he obliged to play the piano every moment. This is not a potentiality. Glenn Gould must <coughs> be able to play and not to play. It's not obliged to serve. He is, uh, we are accustomed to see this as a problem of freedom. Yeah? This concept is uh, extraneous to the Greek, to Aristotle, so he never mentions the problem of freedom. But we modern will, tend, as we think in terms of will, we perceive this problem that you can do a thing and you can also not to do, means you are free to do it or not to do it. It's completely extremes to Aristotle minds, it's only a question of potentiality that you have. And uh, this is important because there are <coughs> other philosophers, the Megarian school, who 
were strongly opposed to this uh, idea of Aristotle, and they said, that's false. Potentiality exists only when you exert it. So it's, uh, potentiality does not exist in itself. It exists only in the moment of its being exerted, put in, a, in the act. Yeah. Well, Aristotle said, no, no, this is not true. Otherwise, how, why we go to an architect and we know that he is an architect also when he does not build. So we know that this is an architect and we go to see him even if, when it's not built. This means that we know that he has the capability, he has the genius of building. Is that clear? But this is a very important point because this means that in some way the dynamism, the capability of making something is defining through its capability not to be exerted. Otherwise, be the, the Megarian school would have a right saying, no, it does not exist. It exists only when you put it in the act. <coughs> Is that clear? So I thought it's interesting in, in, in this more complex model of potentiality, which is the, the, the model of potentiality which we, through which we conceive uh, technologies. So he has this uh, capability. This, uh, and by the way, the example he makes of this uh, architect, uh, player, whatever, all human technology. But then there is a big problem. Because if the possibility not to belongs constitutively to the possibility of doing, then how can one pass to the act? It's the Aristotle always thinks in terms of potentiality. So how can this potentiality not to do suddenly pass in the energy, in the air? It's not a, it's a, it's a very interesting problem. Once you define the, the potentiality through the possibility not to be exerted, then you have to think how transition to the exercise, the exerting, the act, the nervia. But why is the reverse not a problem? I mean, if, if temporarily, if, if I'm, I can potentially type in a computer, so I can be not typing or typing in a computer, those are two modes where potentiality is mm -hmm. present. Why is one direction problematic while the other one? No, no. By the way, Aristotle will say uh, energia, actuality, has the primacy, it is primary. But then, uh, sometimes genetically, you can, on the contrary, sometimes think that uh, potentiality precedes the actuality. The ability, capability of doing something seems to precede the ability to uh, the, the act. Well, I will not uh, dwell on this problem, so, uh, but Aristotle will even state every dynamis, every potentiality of doing something is at the same moment a, pot a impotentiality. So we say every dynamis is a dynamis. <coughs> so, but I, why I insist on this point? Because it is precisely in this context that, that we see that the concept of will appears. Exactly in this problematic context. How can, if potentiality is always already in potentiality, then how can you pass to the act? Pass to the act, you can say. Yeah. 
So if Glenn Gould is defined through his potentiality not to play the piano, how is that he can <coughs> play the piano? This also means what happens of the impotentiality when you pass to the act? What happens to your capability not to play in the moment that you are playing? Does, does this disappear? Is this abolished? Or in some way it is still there? You keep so that a Glenn Gould, when he's playing the piano, probably he plays so well because he keeps his capability not to play. Well, the bad pianist is the one who plays only with his capability of playing. <laughs> so he has not a choice. He can only play, so he doesn't play well. And Glenn Gould plays so well because he keeps his potential. Well, but this is not Aristotle speaking. <laughs> but you know, Aristotle's problem, on, on the contrary, is precisely this. How can we, pa uh, can we pass to the egg? from a dynamism which is always already also in potential. And it's not astonishing at all. Uh, it's clear. It's here that the concept of will first appears in Greek philosophy. To explain this passage, so in the book, Theta of the Metaphysics, I quote a passage when you see clearly, and, uh, sorry, no, this uh, book Theta of the Metaphysics is the passage uh, um, uh, that every dynamist is always already an impotentiality. I mean. But then, uh, another passage of the same book, Aristotle, uh, in order to cope with this problem of the transition from uh, dynamics to <coughs> energia, uh, is forced in some way to introduce the concept of will. I quote the passage. <coughs> As every ir uh, rational uh, potentiality can is able of the context as we saw every rational potentiality can do a thing and can also not to do this it is therefore necessary that there will be a a sovereign principle it implies the term kyrion which in greek mentions the sovereign power, the highest power. So there must be a prince power, something other with respect to dynamis, and we call this orexis, this term which means desire, appetite. So we see for the first time the term, one of the terms in Greek express will refer to the problem of uh, uh, passage from <coughs> potentiality to actuality. If, if every potentiality is always already an impotentiality, we need a, an exterior principle, principle who will make the passage possible. And we call this principle desire, appetite, or access. Therefore, of, of two things, he will do what he desire most. And in the other, in the, another, there is also another passage in the book on the, the soul, the anima. He says that uh, the, the, the capability of thinking, referring to the capability of thinking, he will say that uh, this capability of thinking will pass to the act opotant bulletin when it will. Another term, bulesis, we remember, we saw bulesis, deliberation before the act, etc. 
So we find here for the first time two terms expressing will, but in the context in order, in, of the dynamics and the uh, energy, in order to explain the passage from potentiality to actuality, in order to avoid the difficulties of the impotentiality. How, how can, uh, if every potentiality is an also an impotentiality, <coughs> How is the passage possible? And there is a, a sovereign principle, a kind of a superior principle, which we call desire or bullets, deliberation before the act, etc. So you see, I think that here it's perfectly clear that the concept of will, evolution, is developed in order to explain a problem concerning potential. It's a kind of device in order to cope with the problem of the constitutive ambiguity of human potentiality. As always, human potentiality is, is ambiguous in, in the sense, in the meaning that it can always one thing and its contrary. We need the principle which will allow to resolve this aporia, this, this difficulty. Is that clear? I think it's a, it's a very important point. It shows also that it is not true that the Greek could not think something similar to our problem with. In that context, we see that something similar to what we call a will uh, is precisely employed for a precise problem. So will appears in order to cope with the aporias, the difficulties, the potential. Contrary to what scholar users say, uh, the Greek couldn't uh, think the problem of will. And, no, in, in, a, in a determined context, they are perfectly able. To. They will not generate. So, uh, after Aristotle leaves this concept, so this is true. He will not generalize this and transform this concept of will in our concept, concept of a free subjectivity who decides, which decides. No, this are our modern. This completely, there's nothing like that in Aristotle. But then you see a kind of a beginning, a kind of embryonal uh, of this uh, possibility of this concept in order to explain the potentiality. Mm -hmm. um, does the incorporeal effect precede <coughs> desire? In corporeal? Yeah. In corporeal we spoke before? Or? Yeah, yesterday, yeah. Because it just feels to me like I'm still thinking, well, I understand desire, but there has to be something really quite strong in some cases to make desire possible. I'm still trying to sort of... It just feels like something's... Yeah, sort of in, in some way, as we saw, it does not explain how desire appears. It's a, it's a way it's really introduced uh, as a deus ex machina to explain, to resolve the problem. So th there is no, that's why I say there is no, no the problem of will here is not really thought and general, as a general problem. Here will acts as a device to cope with the difficulties, which concern potentiality. So it is that uh, the yeah, possible solution is the concept of desire or bullesis, and so we change the concept. But anyway, it's, it's a kind of a power of decision. But which is never subjectivized, eh? because then when he will explain, uh, when in the ethics uh, he speaks about desire or existence, we always will see what uh, really determines uh, 
makes someone desire is always the object, the desirable. Desirable, can you see this? Orecticon. So it's not, uh, this desire is not an act of the subject that desire an object. It's, so to say, a power exerted by the desirable on the subject. So it's always because, uh, well, it is, uh, you know, it is, uh, we modern, we think always the problem of subjectivity towards an objectivity. The Greek is the contrary. It's always uh, the thing which... Uh, so, so it's the desirable that make me desire. It's not me that I desire the object. So this is the uh, Greek idea. Yeah. So the Greek idea is uh, the desirable make me desire. But nevertheless, in this uh, the, the passage we quoted, on the contrary, there is really, for the first time, something similar to a modern subjectivity. Because it's a power to decide between two. So, so in some way this passage is really important because uh, we said there is no concept of subjectivity in, in Greek philosophy, but if the place for subjectivity had to be thought, this could be the place. <coughs> because uh, it's something similar to our idea that uh, there is a subject who decides between them in order to cope. Uh, I can, I cannot, uh, I, I will decide the way I will decide. So it's something similar to a subject. Yes? Um, in uh, in football soccer, you have a very different explanation of the uh, passage of, uh, of uh, potentiality and actuality. Um, it has no mention of will or desire. And I'm just wondering if, um, and I can, I can quote here, um, I, I'm wondering what the difference is. I think we're talking about two completely different things. But we say, uh, what is potential can pass over an actuality only at the point at which it sets aside its own potential. On the, on, on the point? Um, uh, at the point at which it sets aside its own potential not to be its uh, autonomy. To set in potentiality aside is not to destroy it, but in the contrary, to fulfill it. To turn potentiality back upon itself in order to give itself to itself. Um, that was a, that was something I uh, I have to say I had uh, a little trouble understanding when I was when I was reading it. So maybe you can clarify uh, what the difference. Yeah, yeah so there the problem we was going to involve because there I was trying to explain another passage. So this problem of potentiality and actuality, uh, Aristotle devotes a whole book of his treatise on metaphysics, on the problem. So we have a lot of, uh, lot of thinking about this. And as he always uh, already uh, has to cope with the problem of uh, impotentiality, uh, he stated that every potentiality is impotentiality for the same and at the same moment. So it has to cope with this problem. And then there is a the passage I was trying to comment there. It's a passage in which he asks them what happens of impotentiality when we pass to the act. And it's very obscure. I, I tried that's an interpretation of it with this pass. So it's a passage which is, which is obscure because it, it will say there this will uh, happen when, at the moment when we pass to the act, then there will be nothing more impossible. So it's not clear at all what it means. But I think, I don't, uh, one could read this, uh, um, the impossibility, the potentiality will be completely abolished. But I think, uh, uh, because then there are also the other lines that follow. One possible interpretation, the one I was giving there, is that on the contrary, this means that potentiality is not left behind. Yeah. Then nothing will remain of uh, potential. But in some way, it is brought into the act. 
because there are other interesting passages when referring to the act of thinking. He will say, when think, thinking thinks something, in some way it, it keeps some potentiality of thinking, and this is how it will then able to think itself. So it's kind of remnant of potentiality. So that interpretation I was doing here, that uh, what he uh, sort of say that when we pass to actuality, we do not simply abolish or leave behind our impotentiality. We keep it with us so we can also overpass the thinking and think it's the thinking itself, for instance, in that case. And that's the example I was doing with uh, Glenn Gould. So Glenn Gould will, uh, so to speak, play also with its impotentiality to play, we not left it beside, so that, um, so to say, it keep its potentiality, even when it passed to the act. And I think this is uh, true, because that's uh, the difference between uh, a real work of art. We could uh, conceive the creation of an act. Don't, don't forget that uh, an act contains ergo work, it means uh, can you say put into work? So you create means that now you create a work from the potentiality. So the, the, the transition between the dynamics to putting into work could be conceived as then first you have the potentiality, then you pass to the act, your potentiality is exhausted, and now you have something in actual work there. But that will be something dead. On the contrary, uh, a great work of art is the, the one that when you read it or see it, you see that the potentiality is still there, is still powerful. It, is, it can even be developed. It's poten the potentiality is there, so that's why you are able to look at it. If there was something only actual, with no potentiality in it, how can you enter it. You can enter also the only because it, it kept its potentiality. And that's you say also its impotentiality of course. Uh, three quick points. Uh, the first and the most immediate. This is a very good model to understand uh, a lot of our contemporary art practices and if you're situated historically with the, the moments yeah. of the contemporary art exaggerated with this. Absolutely. <laughs> contemporary art is the one is, uh, as it is like that, we do not we need any more ergon, no work is necessary. <laughs> we just show our potentiality to <laughs> That, that, that's a good definition. Uh, uh, contemporary art is that. So there, there is a, a complete eclipse, a complete abolishing of the art, of the work, uh, because uh, the potentiality is more important. But, so, but the, the true, the good way is in the work show the potentiality, not to cancel the work and uh, show <coughs> the potentiality, which does not consist in nothing if you don't have a work. <laughs> and it, it even gets a bit more complicated because when you have uh, certain works, then you can leave aside the, the idea of the judgment or evaluation of those works for the moment. But if you have certain works that operate under what you might call an exhausted potentiality, the exhausted potentiality is to leave an evidentiary case, to leave evidence, to leave debris, to leave the mark of its passage or evacuation. Uh, those are usually not very interesting works. Um, but they have a, a, a large support system of infrastructure which is technical. Yes, uh, for, for example, if you have uh, a work which uh, consists of the movement from uh, from Potentia to the act, but the act at its conclusion, by whatever manner you conclude the act and consider it to have passed, uh, re-emerges and persists as a documentation a photograph, a film, a mediation of that passage, then the exhausted potentiality does two things. It leaves an evidentiary trace in the place of its passage, and it also uh, has a promissory structure. It is a performative instrument. It promises the deferral of potentiality to another place, either that 
it could come back, it can be reenacted, uh, or that it can occur elsewhere, or even the simplest claim that it has in some manner truly occurred and that it has been captured within the, in the framework of a technology or a mediation. Does it make sense? No, no. No, but in order to understand, uh, especially contemporary art, this problem of potentiality and potentiality, what happened of the work, uh, it's important. I, I would like to bring up some um, examples as well, like in uh, extremely high risk sports, the very good ones, like the one we saw in but like a sky yeah. like, The very, very good top ones uh, are not only technically good, but they, uh, there is a very <coughs> strong presence of the risk in our. Uh, both of the domain and of the risk, uh, some I mean, trapeze. Or, but I also remember, since you mentioned Glenn Gold, um, a book uh, called The Loser by Thomas Bernhardt. Mm -hmm. Since it's from the point of view of the, those who were not Glenn <coughs> Gold, but which were technically excellent, so like the ones just behind Glenn Gold, <laughs> um, it's a, a kind of a very, very beautiful description of that, that thing that is missing between the perfectly excellent execution in the center. Two small points, but, but also the, the take up this idea of risk also. Foucault, when he proposed the notion of problematization, uh, and it was tragically rewritten by his death, but the problematization that he proposed was exactly this kind of uh, seeing a, what becomes very simply a, a problem and to, to find a form of address to that problem where certain processes like subjectivation and desubjectivation uh, become clear where, where for example, um, uh, will or uh, a, a, a true desire or freedom to act becomes uh, constrained by a machine which, which authorizes it and, 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 and uh, uh, legitimates it. So the whole idea of problematization was almost a, a method which you could find in the uh, examination and uh, uncovering of these problems, exactly these kinds of, of the processes. And the final point is that it also then is in relationship to, to Aristotle's notion of um, a technical being, uh, a technical auto that, that is without uh, telos, and, but that can acquire it, uh, it a hammer or a stone uh, that has no uh, dunamis except perhaps inertia, if we consider it dunamis, uh, but can acquire uh, this. It can be picked up and used as a hammer, as a weapon, uh, as an element in, in construction. So the problem of, of technology, I think, even there, uh, begins to be uh, a problem that, that, that starts to, that has the possibility of becoming clear. Case uh, an, ob an object of this, uh, which is only uh, uh, irrational, the chances, so it's not able to recover it, then it's taken uh, into uh, technical proceedings and then uh, of course it fires. from the concept of potentiality is some way evident, no? it seems evident. But as I already told, uh, this does not correspond to a, the creation, of the, de the development of a theory of will, a theory of the free subject, uh, this is completely absent in this setting. But uh, there we have kind of a hint or intimation on the problem of the subject. Let's uh, have a short uh, pause, let me go on.